Hello, folks. Thank you so much for joining us today. Um, just as a brief intro of our shared background for Leah and I who are um, giving this talk, we are Hackbright Academy grads. And so that is a program for learning full stack software engineering. And it's a program based out of San Francisco Bay Area in California. So we are both junior full stack software engineers. And um, we just wanted to share a little bit about what we learned during our time working on our projects there. So just to get sort of an idea of the folks who are here, your background and familiarity with some of the terms, we're going to ask you to raise your hand if you're familiar with this topic or give us some sort of a signal. So are you familiar or have you worked with object-oriented programming before? All right. How about with method chaining? Have you used method chaining or do you know what that is? Yes. Okay. Object relational mappers, ORMs. Yep. Okay. Cool. And then SQL Alchemy. Have you heard of this or worked with it before? Heard of it? Worked with it? Okay. Awesome. So just so you guys know, we are new engineers. We want to make sure that we're making it clear we're not experts, but we found these tools and techniques to be useful as we created our first project. So it is probably pretty likely that some of you will know some more about some of these topics than we do. So if you have any questions that we're not able to answer, um, we would love to have a discussion with you guys to um, just see if there's any audience knowledge on that matter. <laughs> yes, so um, like Hannah said, we're going to talk about method chaining with SQL Alchemy, RM, and Python. But um, this technique can um, obviously be applied to other languages and other ORMs, like JavaScript. So um, the reason we wanted to learn more about and share out here at Postgres Open about this is because we saw like a potential lack of familiarity of the concept amongst mostly junior developers. So when we're beginning to use method chaining to query data in our projects, um, some of our peers hadn't really formally heard of the concept. But uh, in reality, if you've done some coding, uh, chances are you've seen or used this pattern before. You might not necessarily know it's called method chaining, but um, it's pretty common. Um, we, for us, we found method chaining with RM to be very useful in our own projects, so we think it could be helpful to have this discussion here with you. Okay, so just to overview the session timeline and also set some expectations for those of you who are here, we want to make sure that you know that our total time speaking should be about 30 minutes total. Um, if you have any questions at any time, just feel free to raise your hand, let us know, especially if it's during a convenient pause. We'd like to keep the, the comments or questions in context with what we're talking about if possible, um, just to make it easier to be able to keep things uh, going smoothly. Um, you can also ask questions or have discussion at the end. We should have some time for that. And then in addition, last thing that we wanted to be sure to share with you is if you need to get up for any reason to go outside, check out another session, please feel free to do so. Um, we are not going to hold anything against you if you need to get up and move around. All right, so for the session timeline, we first are going to go over some speaker intros just to give you an idea about our background as individuals. And then we're going to just have some very broad, high-level overviews on object-oriented programming, method chaining, ORMs, and SQL alchemy to make sure that we're all on the same page. We're going to talk about the benefits and downsides and also uses of ORMs and SQL alchemy. We'll go over some case study overviews from our own projects, and then we'll go through our conclusion. So my name is Leah. Um, there's some fun facts about me on the screen. Um, I have one hour flight time log on paper. I uh, was training towards becoming a pilot, although I've actually never flown a plane. Don't ask me how that happened. But um, so uh, my favorite Python string method is .z field. I actually just learned about this a couple of days ago. Um, so basically what it does is that it adds a bunch of zeros to the front of your string. It might be useful to some people. <laughs> There's my GitHub and LinkedIn. I'm happy to connect with other people. A little bit more about my own background. I used to be a policy researcher before I um, fell in love with coding and then decided to move out to San Francisco to become a software engineer. And um, that's where I met Hannah. I went to the coding bootcamp and we met in San Francisco. Okay, so I'm Hannah Johnson. Uh, one of my fun facts was my first job was in Yosemite National Park. So right out of high school, I had the privilege of living and working inside the park, which was really awesome. Um, favorite Python string method is dot .split. I found it very useful in parsing through things. Um, my GitHub is handle, and my LinkedIn is at Hannah Stutzman Johnson. Would love to connect there if you would like to connect. 
Um, and then for my background, my most recent experience is in nonprofit fundraising, and I found that during my time in these roles, uh, I really enjoyed some of the more technical tasks that I was given, and so I decided to just explore more of that at Hackbright Academy, and that's where I met Leah. So, um, yeah, we are very excited to be here to share some of what we learned. So first to overview, what is object-oriented programming? It's a pattern of programming where the solution to a problem is modeled as a group of collaborating objects. And there are four main principles, encapsulation, abstraction, inheritance, and polymorphism. Now that's a lot to talk about, so we're not gonna talk about that all in our session today, but we're going to focus on encapsulation for purposes of this talk. So basics of encapsulation. You create attributes and rules for a common category of an object within a defined class, and this serves as a kind of template. Each individual object or instantiation of that class has its own private state, and other objects don't have direct access to this state. You manage the object state via functions common to its class, and this is called methods. So let's go through a little sample. So here we have a class on the left that's called character, and whenever an object uh, is instantiated of this class, we will be giving it a name and then also uh, defining fetch as none for now. But we do have a method that called fetch that when we do that method on um, an instantiation of the character class, then we will be fetching whatever the substance parameter is that's fed into it. So down below a little bit, we have Jack underscore Jill as the variable um, storing this object and we're creating the object Jack and Jill as the name of a character class. And then later on, we actually um, call this method on the object and we are going to fetch some water. So what is method chaining? We just talked about methods and classes. Method chaining is a technique that allows invocation of multiple methods to the same object at once. And you can use method chaining with object-oriented programming, the use of classes like we just talked about in the previous slide. You can use it when an instance of a class or object has multiple method or functions that you want to call at once. Each method should return a reference to the object itself. In Python, this reference is actually called self, which it returns to the next method in the chain. So here we have one example of just some nested calls where we have the object nested in a bunch of functions. And this looks kind of messy. You can see Jack and Jill somewhere in there, the object, but then it's just wrapped up in all these layers of functions. But if we see this with method chaining applied, it looks kind of more like a story in this situation. We have Jack and Jill, the object. They went up the hill to fetch some water. Jack fell down, broke his crown, and then Jill came tumbling after. A sad story. But it does look more clear than the, the previous example. So um, we learned about what method chaining is. Um, but why should we use method chaining at all? Um, one thing is, a uh, very important part is that it improves co-readability. As shown on the previous slide, what Hannah was talking about, if done right, method chaining shows a very clear sequence of the operations done on the primary object. Also, oops, also um, method chaining reduces lines of code and uh, possibly queries that you're going to run. Um, we have a lot of examples here. This is in JavaScript. Um, on the left side, basically what it's saying is we have a new client and then we use the dot set uh, name function. We have, we set the name of the client to be John Smith and then we set the phone number of John Smith and then the last line, we're basically telling it to give us the name of the new client. On the right hand side, it does exactly the same thing. But um, it's just much more succinct and it's shorter. Also, you can see that we don't need to think of a new variable name for the new client object. And so it's, it's great because we don't ever want to think of variable names. It's really difficult. You can see that's how I feel on, uh, in that picture whenever I have to think of a new variable name. All right, so let's put on our imagination caps for a little bit and imagine that we're starting up a web app project together. We've got loads of fascinating data for our planned Postgres database. We're going to need to seed the data, query the data, filtering by related data points across multiple tables, and we're going to need to be able to dynamically alter the query using user input. But how do we query it? Well, we could write a complex SQL query, 
uh, might look something like this. But for those of us who aren't as familiar with raw SQL, it can be tricky to get this sorted out just right. Here's another way we can try to make the querying more organized. We could chain together the queries with SQL. The results of the queries can be combined using the set operations of union, intersection, and difference. This is also kind of tricky because we need to run multiple queries and chain them together appropriately. So again, if we're not as familiar with SQL or we need to get something happening fast, this can be difficult. Isn't there an easier way? We're in a hurry to finish up this MVP. What if we could abstract some of the pain points? If there were something that would allow us to treat the rows in our database like objects, the tables like classes, and check their attributes or columns using class methods. That would be so awesome. Yes, that would be, and that's why we like SQL Alchemy. So for those of you who are familiar with SQL Alchemy or just ORM in general, um, this should be probably just a review, but for those of you who are not familiar with the concept, SQL Alchemy is a Python toolkit uh, and an ORM. Here we'll be mainly talking about its uh, ORM component. But just a quick overview of what the core of SQL Alchemy is. Um, the core itself is actually a fully featured SQL abstraction toolkit and also a SQL expression language, which basically just translates Python expressions into SQL expressions. And the object relational mapper, the ORM, is actually an optional package which builds on, uh, on top of the core. So ORM, um, for those of you who are not really familiar with the term, is actually a library that automates the transfer of data store in, a, um, in relational databases and in, turn them into objects that are more commonly used in um, application code. ORMs provide a very high level abstraction upon the relational database, so that allows a developer to write Python code, well, for SQL Alchemy at least, it, you can write Python code instead of SQL to do your normal operations like create or update or delete, that type of things with your database and data schema. Um, uh, this is great because developers can then use the programming language that they're most comfortable with to work with database instead of learning or writing SQL statements. Um, like we noted before, SQL Alchemy ORM only works for Python, but there are a lot of other ORMs that exist, like SQLize, it works with um, Node.js if you're building a backend in Node. So now we can dive, dive right in. Um, how do we set up a database schema in SQL uh, Alchemy? It's actually pretty easy um, to define and set up database. As shown in this um, sample Python code here, you can quickly create a tables with predefined data types, and as well as primary key and foreign key constraints. SQL Alchemy works with a lot of other type of constraints, like unique as well. Um, so here you can see in the code, we have two classes uh, up on the screen. One is address, and the other one is user. So each one of these map to a table in our SQL database. And we also set the table name here. You can see uh, for address, we set the table name to be addresses and the uh, user is users in our database. And if we look closer on the class of uh, address, we have an ID column, which uh, the data type is set to be integer. Um, primary key is set to true, um, which means that in our own, in our SQL database, it's gonna auto-generate, auto-increments, um, all those normal things that happens with a primary key is gonna be unique. You don't have to worry about that yourself. And email address column, the, the data type is string, which um, I think is varchar in, in Postgres. And nullable is set to false, so it cannot, the whole column cannot be null. And we have a user ID, which is the foreign key pointing down towards our user, user uh, class, also the user table in our, in our database. So we also define the, we can also define the relationships here. So we have, for the cl uh, address class, we have user relationship, which pointing towards the user class. And you can see here in the user class, we have an address relationship set defines. So basically, they're pointing towards each other, so SQL Alchemy knows that they are, um, they are connected. So after declaring our schema, the next step is that we want to write a Python script to see our database. Um, with tons of libraries and tools available, we can extract raw um, data from many different sources. Um, for example, you can extract and um, process data from a JSON file or a GeoJSON file if you're dealing with um, geospatial data or a CSV file, really anything that uh, Python can read and process. It's very easy to clean up data with different Python tools and modules like date time modules if you're doing some pre-processing before you seed your database. Um, so 
like going back to the concept of um, OOP, um, we have each object is used to instantiate a new instance of the relevant class, like the class we defined earlier. And then the object is added to our current session, uh, current database connection sessions with the session.add. And then finally, we use session.commit to commit the transaction to our database. This is great because uh, unless you do the session.commit, you won't um, accidentally modify your database without wanting to. All right, so here's a condensed example of some code to seed a database using SQL Alchemy. At the top of the code, import the needed classes from your model file, which we walked through a few slides ago. Open a file, like maybe a CSV of data, and process it for a CSV row by row. For each file, specify the row and columns to extract data, to extract data from and instantiate the object. Add only the information that you need. Use session.add for each object to add it to the batch that you will want to commit, and session.commit once you have all of your objects ready. Just note here, again, that the primary keys and the foreign keys are auto-established based on the modeling that we previously created. So some benefits of using SQL Alchemy. It is open source, woo, it's Pythonic, a way of treating your database just like any other object that you'd be programming with. Sometimes ORM built queries are actually more performant than a SQL query that you'd write yourself, especially for us juniors, if we're not sure which way might be more performant. SQL Alchemy can accommodate raw SQL statements as well as plain result sets and object instances can be generated from these results in the same manner as any other ORM uh, operation. The unit of work system is a central part of SQL Alchemy's ORM. It controls the life cycles of every object in a session. It reduces accidental database commit timing related bugs. It organizes pending insert, update, delete operations into queues and flushes them all into one batch and produces the maximum efficiency and transaction safety and minimizes chance of deadlocks. It has flexible design, making it less painful to write complex queries. It also has enterprise level APIs designed for efficient and high performing database access. It can be used with SQLite, MySQL, Oracle, MS SQL, Firebird, Sybase, and many other databases I've never heard of. This can also be useful if you're using Postgres for the heavy lifting paired with a lighter weight DB for other tasks or just multiple databases. So method chaining with SQL Alchemy ORM. Thinking back to the slide where we discussed benefits of method chaining, now let's look at an example specific to SQL Alchemy and method chaining. There are a couple ways that we can query uh, parameters and chain. So we could chain together on a base query in chunks as this top example on the slide. You start off with a variable to store the base query and then chain additional methods onto it line by line. This can be useful if you want to restrict which query logic to add on according to various environment-based conditionals like user input that may or may not be present on the front end. Or we can chain them together all in one go. Save your query results in a variable and chain all methods and parameters together on one line. This option makes for drier, less repetitive code, plus it looks nice. So it sounds great, but like everything else, there are downsides that come with method chaining with an ORM. And one thing we uh, didn't really talk about earlier, but it's kind of dif difficult to debug a query um, if something has gone wrong. Say you run your Python script and the terminal gets angry and yell at you, hey, something's wrong with line 11. And you went to line 11 in your script and it's this really long chain of different methods. Maybe something is wrong with one of them, maybe something's wrong with several of them. It's gonna take you some time to debug what exactly went wrong. Um, also, if you're already well-versed in SQL, which I'm sure many of you in the rooms are, um, ORM-based queries might be less performant than the raw SQL versions. So for a lot of people, what they're doing is you're trading a decrease in your performance, but you, are, you get an increase in developer productivity because you're basically just working in Python. Um, so one example of where um, ORM-based queries might actually be slower would be, say you need to query um, data across different tables. Um, it's faster to actually just write the raw SQL joint statements uh, instead of using the SQL Alchemy built-in relationships that we saw earlier when you define the relationships. Um, also, some functionalities are not really built out across all, all ORMs. The, depending on the ORM you're using, the, um, the functionalities and compa compatibilities may vary. 
say, um, so SQL alchemy has been around for a long time, pretty mature, pretty established. But then there are also the newer or more experimental ORMs that might not really suit your needs if you're coding with another language, not, say not Python. Uh, also, a code base, even with very heavy ORM usage, we probably still have some raw SQL handwritten queries anyways. Um, like Hannah has mentioned before, the good thing is it's pretty easy to accommodate raw SQL queries with SQL Alchemy. If you think of a very hyper-optimized query, you can still run it with SQL Alchemy. We have two more downsides. Um, so with this is specific just to SQL Alchemy, um, maybe with some OR, other ORMs, it's not true. But with SQL Alchemy, the database section is confined to one database connection. Um, this can get tricky if you're working with multiple databases. It's gonna take you time and effort to configure um, SQL Alchemy to work with your current setup. It's gonna be a learning curve. I'm not saying it's impossible, but it's definitely gonna take time. And the last point I think is more important just for junior developers. Um, SQL is a very important skill for developers, you, whether you, you can build it across different platforms, whether you're building an app with Python as backend, Go as backend, or Node.js, the SQL stays the same. But if you are ha relying heavily on using ORM with, um, to work with your database, then your SQL skills is definitely gonna get rusty because you're just practicing your primary programming language. Okay, so now for the fun part. We're going to go through a couple of case studies. How we used these tools and techniques. As a part of Hackbright's curriculum, we each created an individual capstone project, a full stack web app which we built out in about four and a half weeks on a subject of our choice. Our stack included Postgres, Python, Flask, and SQL Alchemy on the back end. Leah and I will discuss our projects and how we made use of method chaining to query our Postgres databases. So for my project, I named it Child Care Check. And basically, back when I was a preschool teacher, I knew that there was a lot of data out there on licensing. And when I was looking for data for my project, I found this source for California State that had just this wealth of information on all of the child care centers in the state. And there is a portal where users can go and filter these child care centers based on certain criteria, like location or name. But there was all this other data that wasn't filterable on their site. For example, citations, so adherence to the licensing requirements. You can't filter by those things on the state site. So I thought, oh, it'd be really interesting because as a parent, like I would want to know that I'm sending my child to a center that is relatively adherent to the licensing requirements. So I'll create a site that allows users to filter by those things and also plots all the centers on a map to make it more visually obvious and easy to look at. So my challenge was that I needed a flexible route to let people choose various filters to search through my database of California-based child care centers. And users of Child Care Check have the option to use between zero uh, filters on their search or up to eight filter parameters all at once. So I needed a route that was flexible enough to handle that. So what did I do? Well, first, I searched through the form fields returned from the front end and tie them to variables. Those with nothing will be falsy when I'm looking through my conditionals later on. I created a base query of the facilities class made from the facilities database table. For each identified user input parameter, the variable is truthy for the conditionals. The code beneath the associated conditional logic runs and more methods and parameters for filtering are tacked onto that base. The full query runs at the end and returns the user specified results. So here we can see in the code example that I'm using request.args.get to get the content from the front end if there is any and then the base query is facility.query looking into my facilities table and then you can see the conditional logic and how it will hit it with the actual uh, query being called for all of those sites at the end. Without SQL Alchemy or in uh, method chaining, I would have had to use a lot of additional conditional logic, limit the ways I allowed users to filter their results, or spend a lot of time learning to piece together more complex SQL queries to use. So it really helped me get my project up and running much more quickly. So similar to Hannah, my, um, my first web application, I also use SQL Alchemy with Postgres and Python and Flask as my back end. 
Um, so the idea of my app sort of came from when I first moved to San Francisco. I wasn't, I was new to the city, don't know the neighborhood well. I just wanted a way to see if my morning run was uh, on a safe path or my late night row is, is safe enough. Um, so I, I couldn't find an app like that, so I decided to build one myself. So um, basically what the app does is that the user input their start and end point, and then I'm gonna give them, as you can see, it might be a little small here, um, on the screen there is, I give them a path and uh, directions, like how to get there on the, on the right hand side, and I also show there's a little crime score on the top right, uh, telling them like how safe this is. I'm pulling in data from San Francisco Police Department. And, um, and I also highlight the, path, the incidents that have happened along the route in the past year. So um, this is all great, but the challenge for me was is I need a complicated query to filter crime data within a specific geolocation at a specific um, time, mostly the user's input time. Um, for me, the, the specific geolocation, I also need to, um, I want to expand it a little bit. I don't want crime that happened just right on the path. I want it to happen like within a certain area, within the neighborhood. So, so this is a little snippet of one of the, the backend route that I wrote. Um, so what it's doing is I'm giving it a line string of a route. A line string is just a data format for, for the route. Um, and then I return the violence score in a buffer area, like I'm stretching out the route like 200 meters, giving a 200 meter buffer. So um, originally I, I did, I went crazy with method chaining, all of this were chained all together. I decided to split it up a little bit so um, it's clearer to see. Um, I, for the base query, I'm just specifying what columns I want. Here I'm just doing a count, I'm, I'm getting the crime score. The instant code is the, basically the crime score. It's uh, depending on the severity of the crime. And then I add on the filter. Inside the filter, I'm basically just doing the, saying that I want the, wanted to stretch out, stretch, stretch out the route, um, given 200 meters parameter, and and then given the current hour. But then I did a group by, and then uh, a fir I gra grabbing the first record that matches what I wanted. Um, it really doesn't matter. I could do dot all here. This is only supposed to be one anyway. Um, so without method chaining, I would need many new variables to store different query results, and the code would get longer. And also, I wasn't that familiar with SQL at the point. For me to write something this complicated, it would, take, it would have taken me a much longer time to just learn and do it. But one thing to note is that um, I didn't use method chaining in all of my backend routes, because um, sometimes I needed to reuse some of the, the query results. In those cases, it actually makes more sense to just do them separately and um, store them into different variables instead of putting them all together in one long chain. So thank you all so much for sticking with us through our presentation today. Um, we really appreciate the opportunity to be here and share some of the things that we've learned while building our first web app. Just to a quick recap of what we've talked about today. Method chaining with ORM is not the solution for every querying problem, but Especially for new people newer to SQL querying or in need of a quick way to write some queries, it can be very useful. It can make for drier code. It can make your code more readable. It's relatively easy to set up. You can potentially work in a language that you're more comfortable with. Challenges of retrieving data from across multiple tables can be abstracted. And you can get a project or MVP up and running pretty quickly. Again, thank you for your time and support on this Friday the 13th, a very spooky day. <laughs> We'd now like to open the floor to discussion, questions, thoughts, et cetera, if you have any that you'd like to uh, share with us. I do have a question. Yeah. Uh, Hannah, in your example, yep. uh, there was an outer going between two tables. Uh, next slide, please. Oh, sorry. Yeah, yeah, yeah it's fine. So, so there's an outer join here in the query. Yeah. Um, do you mean doing this in code in what way, I guess? Well, so, I mean, where, where is the outer join being performed? Is SQL Optimal writing a query between these two tables with an outer join in it? Ah. Or is it querying both tables and then joining, and then joining them, them itself? Because you seem to kind of indicate before that one of the weaknesses of SQL Optimal or writing your own SQL is that it's not going to join. It must be through some joins, though, right? 
Yeah, I don't know which part that that was mentioned in directly, but um, I and I can't understand. Sorry. Uh-huh. Yeah. Um, so I think, and I can't answer this with a hundred percent certainty, but in regards to what SQL Alchemy does with, like, whether it does outer joins or whether it doesn't, um, my understanding is that this method is doing an outer join okay. in SQL, um, and that SQL Alchemy is telling it to do that. Oh, okay. Uh, but anyway, it, with it, you were able to kind of get a debug log of the queries that it was writing. Um, just for a, you couldn't really do much about it, but, it <laughs> <laughs> right. but at least you could kind of see it. Uh, I'm wondering if there's a similar facility in SQL Alchemy where you can at least get an idea of what it's pushing down to the server. So the question was about a debugging log, essentially, within SQL Alchemy. Um, I'm actually not familiar with whether that's a feature or not. I would assume that since it's so um, mature that there may be a feature like that. Are you familiar, Leah? Yeah. Um, so there is, with SQL Alchemy, you can uh, and just enable the debugging log. So when you open your web page, basically on the lower right-hand side, it, um, I think it w is work. For us, we use Flask SQL Alchemy. It's basically just helping, because we're using Flask as our backend. And for Flask SQL Alchemy, there is a debugging tool. It's gonna show you um, actually how many SQL queries have run for your one line of um, SQL Alchemy um, code and show you a little time, like how much time it has taken. You can, well, you can add a log to the console. Yeah, yeah, so that too. When, you, when it executes a dot all, it yeah. compiles all of your functions that you've called and then creates the SQL, sends it off to Postgres. Yeah. Yeah. Yeah, I've gotten error messages from that too. It's like, uh, oh, I tried to run this SQL um, command, but it didn't work and give us all these error messages. But it's, it's kind of, it hasn't been very helpful for me when it spits out an error message. It's kind of hard to tell what's what went wrong because it's really long. Like, all these things gone wrong. <laughs> but yeah, yeah, yes. Yes, you're definitely right. Even when, even like in our previous example of like joining, or like or versus using the built-in relationships, if you you can see like why it's slower, because you can see if you're using the built-in relationship, it's actually running more queries than using if you specifying I'm just gonna do a join. So yeah, you're definitely right. So. Uh Yes. Uh, I see that uh, you have uh, information on this from San Francisco and uh, the district. Uh, are you planning to add some more cities and maybe countries? <laughs> and if so, uh, how do you think what exactly data sources are available for them? Yes, so um, for most cities, I want to say for most cities in um, the United States, they actually have requirements of um, this uh, city is required to have some sort of open database. That's where I get the data. And I know for, um, I checked um, Oakland and several other cities, they have similar database. The problem with that is, I originally planned to do this for the whole Bay Area, but different cities, um, although the database is some, somewhat clean, but they have, they're storing different information. So I think at least for the US cities, if you want to expand to more, uh, more cities, it's definitely possible. And all this source code is on GitHub. Feel free to, if you want to check it out or anything. Yes, uh, you're right. So when you write these then change this way, does that turn into actual like nested function calls in the SQL or does it nest them in the at the Python level sort of when it gets the data back? Um, 
I actually don't know 100%, um, but I think one time when I check it, at least for the inside, like inside the filter, um, the, the, uh, the order stays the same. But when I don't know if like outside, the outside chaining, um, if it changes the outside uh, order in, in some ways. But yeah. Yes. Yeah. Kind of get an idea of, of how it's handling it and, and just what it looks like. I mean, at least for me, I think it'd be extremely cool to see the output of these function chains and, and yeah. get an idea of what, what's actually going to the database. Yeah, um, that's a... Maybe it's because we're at a database conference, but, you know. <laughs> <laughs> but I see a lot of people nodding, so I think we all kind of agree. It'd be really cool to see that. Yeah. I want to extend uh, Marcus's uh, question about this different dance and mm -hmm. I cannot see import clause. I mean, uh, how... Yes. Um, so uh, on top of SQL Alchemy, um, so SQL Alchemy doesn't really know um, PostGIS command. So on top of that, I'm using Geo Alchemy. So it does something very similar to SQL Alchemy, but it just understands all this. Um, post, it's just catered to PostGIS. So suppose if, if I want to use uh, my own extension, I need to implement uh, another uh, model in uh, Python? And yeah, possibly. No comment. No. <laughs> <laughs> no, we would love to. Yeah, we really enjoy being here. Thank you. <laughs>